Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome everyone here who's listening to this online streaming uh, part of the program, but also those of you who listen later on YouTube. We have had over 700 programs since we began uh, doing these uh, in the pandemic, when the pandemic began, so that we could use the Commonwealth Club's uh, facilities to keep producing programs in spite of the fact that we could no longer have a live audience. And it's been very successful. Thank you all for watching. And today we have Kenny Werner here to speak about his book, Becoming the Instrument. Fascinating thing, you just watched Kenny play, he's a famous jazz musician and composer. Um, but he's written a book uh, which goes uh, pretty far beyond that. He does teach uh, in this area of self-mastery in using music. And Kenny, well, first of all, welcome to the Commonwealth Club and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And. Uh, why don't we start a little bit with some of the stories? You were a child prodigy. Uh, you, you started playing at a very young age. So we had a picture of you up before at six years old playing. Um, so why don't you tell a little bit about how you came across the idea you had, you had perfect pitch, you, you could play music. Just tell us a little bit about how, how that you know, came to you in, in, in your childhood. Well, it was really a gift. And for that reason, I never felt especially proud for it mm -hmm. because it just, came. Uh, the way it actually started is I went to a friend's birthday party at seven and his father played piano at the house and I'd never seen that live. Uh, and I was mesmerized, but I was also quite impressed how it was the center of attention. So those, <laughs> yeah, those two things had me running home telling my parents, get me a piano. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got a, a, a Wurlitzer with an option to buy. And uh, mm -hmm. I started picking out songs I knew immediately and this is sort of where the philosophy comes from, too. I walked into the kitchen and said, my mom, good news, mom, we won't be needing those lessons. I figured out how to play. <laughs> so, At seven um, years old, huh? <laughs> yeah, but I never really veered from that conviction. Mm -hmm. You know, so then uh, I didn't know I had perfect pitch for four years. I had a teacher that would show me a book and open it up and I'd say, would you play it for me? And I, I never practiced it. And then I try it once or twice from memory and I come back and I play, I'm sure it wasn't the perfect version, but it was close enough where she didn't know and I was fine. Uh, but then I got a real teacher and I found out after four years, I could barely read. I was just mm -hmm. picking it. And then one day he played something and then he went into the kitchen to get some Hawaiian punch or something. And I played what he played and he came back. He said, do you have perfect pitch? And mm -hmm. I said, what's that? And he mm -hmm. told me what it was. And I, he said, turn your back. And he started playing chords and everything. And I named them. And I said, he said, you have perfect pitch. I said, you don't, you know, <laughs> knowing that, and there's a lot of people with perfect pitch, but they will right. tell you it's so natural. It's as natural as knowing colors. Mm -hmm. You're just surprised that other people don't have it. Right. You, you, you hear all the tones. The tones are so distinct that you know what they are. Or you can name them. And just as well as if you know what, what color colors are around you. Yeah. It's a very great analogy for it. Um, and most of us are, are sound blind in that sense. So we, 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 don't, we, we hear the music, but we, well, we never could piece apart all the tones. You know, sometimes I think it's a benefit because when I hear a piece, I've never gotten the full benefit of it because I could see reams of music paper going by with mm -hmm. it notated. Uh -huh. and it takes a little of the illusion away. It's like <laughs> if you're watching a, a, a Broadway play, but you're seeing everybody move the front scenery in the back or something. It would be yeah, a little, yeah. I don't think I got the full effect as the real novice, you know, as the real mm -hmm. uh, just listener doesn't know what they're listening to. Well, but you did get the enthusiasm and that's generally what, what you know, the novice stage is for, is to get the enthusiasm, right? Well, the enthusiasm is to uh, turn yourself on in front of other people. Yeah. 
And you've been performing since young, young age too, right? Uh, publicly? Well, I started been performing at about nine. And then I had a, bl a, a blush with, if blush is the right word, with fame, I had done a, a record. That's what mm -hmm. that picture is from, was the, uh, from the record date. I wore uh -huh. my Perry Como sweater and a, <laughs> I was already ready to, you know, be a recording musician. And I did some TV shows and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't really happen. And I went into an ordinary rotation of weddings and bar mitzvah. I, at my bar mitzvah, my, ba my father hired a really good band. So I sat in with them the next uh -huh. week they hired me. So from <laughs> on, I was playing weddings and bar mitzvahs. Well, that, <laughs> that helped your dad pay for the bar mitzvah. <laughs> I guess, well, I, he let me keep the money, so. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you've done this with music your whole life, and you, 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 you studied all kinds of music, but you, you drifted, or not drifted, maybe you just jumped into jazz. That's your favorite, right? No, it was an accident. Uh -huh. You know, it being the 70s, none of, a lot of us didn't have plans the way I see young people have. You know, people yeah. have some sense of where they're going today. I was just, I think if I really did what I was meant to do, I would have been scoring movies. And when I admitted that, my music uh -huh. became more cinematic. But I happened to go to a school where they improvised and the dominant form of improvisation was jazz. And when I left school, someone called me for a gig. It was a jazz gig. Five years later, I don't think I ever made that decision. Uh -huh. But that's, you know, jazz is just a language. So if you ask me, do I speak jazz? Yeah, I really do. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is never bound by jazz. Well, you have a great story about, about somebody, you, you, you were performing classical music at a camp, a summer camp. Uh, and, and, and someone came up to you afterwards and said, the young man, you know, about the Browns. Oh, they made a comment like about the Browns. Well, yeah, yeah, why, why don't you tell that story? That's a great I'm trying story. Trying to give you a bridge version. Yeah. Well, you see, I grew up in Long Island, New York, with a healthy disrespect for art. Mm -hmm. Art really wasn't important where I grew up. Watching television was. Mm -hmm. So when I became enmeshed in art, I didn't worship it beyond, you know, first I thought it was something you have to hide. You have to act like you worship it uh -huh. because everybody else does. But then I started to realize it was kind of a blessing in disguise because when you play, you don't want to be aware that anyone has ever played that instrument before you. Mm -hmm. Respect is a great thing, but it doesn't really help if I'm about to play and the words Keith Jarrett go off in my mind, that's not mm. going to be helpful. Yeah. So, you, know, <laughs> so, you know, you want this virginal experience almost every time. So one of the things you have to throw away is this so-called importance of it. But when it makes you play better, that's the justification for doing it. So mm. in that way, I was used to teach a Gunther Schuller, if you know him, a great composer mm. and conductor and writer of books as well. Um, he ran a camp and he was the author of an idea, what they called third stream music. And third stream music was either classical musicians who could improvise, which back in the 50s did not happen, mm -hmm. or jazz musicians that could really handle uh, heavier loads of written music. Mm -hmm. So in that tradition, he had a jazz camp and a classical camp. So the classical people would come to all the jam sessions at night. The jazz guys would go to all the recitals in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was a great way of just mixing. So at one point, the uh, the violinist, the violin teacher there, a man named Young Nam, uh, who a uh, great violinist, uh, teaches, still teaches today in Minnesota, um, asked me, why don't you play something with us? And I said, well, I haven't played classical music since I was a concert piano major at Manhattan School of Music, which I dropped out of and went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I said, but sure, okay, you know. So it was a Brahms piece. It was just one movement of a Brahms quartet, which was piano, violin. It was an unusual quartet. It was piano, violin, viola, and cello. Or maybe it was a trio. I don't even remember. It was an mm -hmm. odd, odd thing. It was even the third movement was 17 pages. Mm -hmm. you know, so I always, when I talk to the classical musicians, I say, all the music is too damn long. In this century, <laughs> it's got to be under 15 seconds. <laughs> you know, but anyway, you start to practice it my way by isolate, you know, by well, if you understand effortless mastery, which was my previous book, mm -hmm. it means in the moment without thoughts. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to make your hands play, you want to watch and see if they've learned it yet. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to learn it that way, which means you're out. And this is the lesson from music to life. Mm -hmm. If you don't push the stream forward, the stream will move easier. So if you're working on something, and you're just present, you're likely to become familiar with it more than if you feel that deep desire to become familiar with it. That actually is what gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm practicing and everything's fine. And the night before, Gunther asked to uh, hear us play it. And I fell to what I didn't do anymore, but I had also written about not doing. I really wanted him to like it. Mm -hmm. But we're playing and I'm, I'm like actually breathing hard, trying to keep up with these other musicians because I'm really not that well prepared. I had my family there. I had little time to practice, mm -hmm. you know. And, I re and, and Gunther just goes, well, I guess you'll play it tomorrow and that'll be the end of it. <laughs> 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 it wasn't exactly what I had in mind, you know. And then I realized, you know, you violated your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. Go in there. So next morning I went in and I started to play it this slowly. And for your people that are, will be watching, mm -hmm. you know, really. Da, de. And while I did, I was in a space, what I call the space, which hopefully we'll, we might talk mm -hmm. about. We'll and talk I just let my fingers enter the data again. There's no sense in practicing it fast. We're going to do it this afternoon. And uh, even the other people came around and said, wow, you practice so good. I said, well, I don't know. So then we start to play it. And boom, my hand started to play it. It didn't play everything, but it left out whatever it couldn't groove. Classical mm -hmm. music grooves just like any other music. And, I felt, mm -hmm. and with piano players, the left hand will bring it. Jazz piano players, it's the left hand. They never did that much with the left hand. So whenever the left hand had to do it, it could bring it down. But then I would play some bit of it that keeps the groove going. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I was playing all of it. And then I was in my space. And then I even looked at the violinist. And I mm -hmm. let, I'm smiling like I would with jazz. I'm saying, yes. oh, I know this already. And he's hearing people laugh. He's going like this. And he looks, what's going on? He looks at me and he sees me like that. And he goes, <laughs> smiling and playing. And the whole piece lifted up and the audience gave a cheer in the middle of the piece. Mm -hmm. so at the end of the piece, I tell you, anybody was, if, if you think the important thing about classical music is not making mistakes, there's nobody that was there that day that doesn't remember that concert. And mm -hmm. everybody was buzzing. And Gunther comes up to me and says, that's what I meant by third stream. And, and everything yeah. my ego wanted got because I had to totally drop the ego mm -hmm. to let the peace in, right? So mm -hmm. I, everything's great. But this one woman saunters up to me like this. She's mm -hmm. the local piano teacher in uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. That's where we were. And she taps me on the shoulder and goes, young man, sloppy Brahms, like that. <laughs> she goes away. It could have been a cartoon, you know. <laughs> mad at her. And I said, why? She's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was sloppy Brahms. The question is, what's important about music? So in a way, the story illustrates more that it's an inner freedom. Not the, If you have an inner freedom, that's the greatest sound, with, a, with or without mistakes. You might make a mistake but you'll never go wrong. Well, let's uh, divert for one second to a really big music topic um, that, that the 21st century and the even late 20th century was dealing with, which is the fact that because music is now digitally available everywhere so that people can hear absolutely the best performers everywhere, that there's pressure on all the people moving up, that that's the standard that they have to play to. Whereas if you go back 150 years, every community had their local musicians some that were really very good, some that were passable, mediocre and everything, but they were all big popular stars in their local community because they could play this music and that's the only way people heard music. And, right. and, now, and now you've got, you know, 200 people at the top of piano playing in the world and et cetera, et cetera. And so, and so this intensity that you're talking about, this intense pressure to technically perform I'm sure you think gets in the way of the musicality of the performances. And, and there must be some who have both and, and they maybe tend, but it, it, it seems to me that this, this shift technological uh, that has taken place has had a big influence on how people who are making their way up in music, uh, you know, move along. Well, I mean, that topic calls for many different answers. For one thing, mm -hmm. when Stravinsky saw the microphone, he said, that's it, music is dead. <laughs> yeah. And, and he also gave uh, talks at Harvard in the 50s, and he predicted that music would become completely subservient 
to the culture instead of the phenomenon that it is. And he was right about that, of course, too. You can't mm -hmm. even get your tooth filled without music. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, uh, what the thing you're talking about goes back to the early 20th century. It's mm -hmm. only before recording. So you have to go back, you know, practically to the beginning of the, of the century. And before that, first of all, uh, musicians much more readily improvised because they didn't have one standard. So, right. of course, people have been subject to, subjected to a technological standard through the replay of the thing. The point is, are you technically more perfect when you're not concerned about technical perfection? Mm -hmm. Or are you more liable to make a, a mistake when you are concerned about making mistakes? So, mm -hmm. yes, I mean, you want to get to that level. And sometimes it freezes out musicality. But... If you're practicing, well, yeah, this is a really, I could I do the hour on this first thing you said, because you practice something. Uh, and again, this is a lesson that people can do somewhere else. Most people practice and they try to avoid mistakes. That's exactly the wrong way to practice. And that's the ego. What you want to do is play it carelessly and find out where the mistakes are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you narrow it down to those places. So there has to be a degree of self generosity to allow yourself to make mistakes because a mistake makes someone feel bad about themselves, not about the mistake. So there's a sort of a, uh, is a contagious, there's a contagion to a uh, fear of mistakes because it tends to make you rate yourself as a person as it, as irrational as that sounds. That's exactly what most musicians do. That's why there's such a big drama around playing well. It's not really, respect for the form it's much more narcissistic if i play bad i will feel bad and it's good to get to that reality because if you can work on your self generosity yourself you could say self-love but that's like the ultimate express but at least self-acceptance so mm -hmm. it's not dependent on how you played yesterday or tomorrow then you can deal with the music head on and not feel so emotionally vulnerable to it and with that state of mind, you can actually go after mistakes. And what you want to do is not eliminate the mistakes, but let the hands know it so well that you can, you know, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and, you know, uh, Kashmishimism. Mm -hmm. There is a concept where you can witness your life. And the greatest artists, if you think about this, they're not just playing, they're watching it being played. Mm -hmm. That's why it's always on that level. Can you tune the body to be that sharp of an instrument? Absolutely. But most people can't do it because of this ego seesaw. So if you get the ego out of the way, you can actually squarely aim at that. Now, the societal issue as to whether music should be played that way or not is a non-starter because that's just the way it is. But still, when, when that spirit trumps uh, actual neatness, mm -hmm. everybody knows it and nobody forgets that concert. It happens in, in uh, you know, public speaking, too, because it used to be that everyone had to be so formal and so many professors were afraid of saying something that their colleagues would then say, that's not accurate. You know? And so they were concerned and very formal. But, but people don't want to watch a formal uh, conversation or a formal lecture because, because the, the, there's too much emotional restriction going on. At you the know, same it's, time. it's a paradox, obviously. Yeah. When you are concerned about what everybody thinks about what you're saying, there's no conviction there anyway. It does not yeah. resonate. And therefore, people are sitting there, but they might be thinking, did I leave my keys in the door? Or, <laughs> you know, they'll think yeah. mundane thoughts because they're getting a mundane presentation. And the mundaneness of it is simply trying to control how others are going to feel about what you're doing. Right. It's much better to go... There's a thing I learned from music that someone can learn about public speaking. That's why the book is supposed to help others do what they do with a higher degree of light. So mm. I know as a musician, you don't get up there with the desire to turn everybody on. You mm. get up there and you turn yourself on. Mm -hmm. And that resonates in the souls of the people who are sitting there. But your desire to turn them on will lower the resonance to the point where nobody's feeling any light. Just mm. like... Well, a light bulb does not desire to light a room. It is connected to a power source. And then it, there's a tiny thing in it and it vibrates. And as that vibrates, the room is a lit. Well, a human is the same way. And when a human 
goes for their own inner vibe. I I dig me playing this, mm -hmm. or I dig this, right? They start to vibrate, and the audience starts to vibrate. Each soul starts to vibrate, just like when you walk a dog down the street in a suburban town, mm -hmm. all the other dogs in the houses bark. Right, right. When one soul barks on stage, all the souls in the audience start to bark. <laughs> And uh, for anybody who's too young, the words I dig, you know, um, oh. come from the 70s. <laughs> I think it's from the 50s. 50, even 50s, yeah. Even 40s, yeah. The hipsters, the original. Yeah. Um, in your book, you, you have a very interesting line. You said you don't really deal with sin and think about sin a lot, but there is a sin in music. And why don't you explain what you think still deserves the word of sin? I thought that the only, well, see, again, if you take the music out of it, Mm -hmm. I think the only sin is valuing, devaluing your life based on something as insignificant as the fact that you play a musical instrument. Yeah, and how well you play. Yeah, yeah. And how well you play. I think that's taking a gift and selling it way short. Mm -hmm. But if you're convinced of that, your art goes to another level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we may be employing some philosophy, but we're employing philosophy as a strategy to elevate our performance to where our neurotic self would have liked it to be. <laughs> if that makes any sense, hopefully. It's a very good way to put it, yes. Um, the, the, the neurotic self. So uh, how, did you, how did you develop an idea about music that is so psychological? I mean, what, 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 what ideas did you get, uh, study, get into, whatever, that helped you see this point of view? Or, or, or did you, you felt it yourself already as a, I, as a child? I think I felt it from the beginning. I yeah. felt that the state of mind was more important than the music. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got a certain state of mind, it's an incredible effect of the music. Mm -hmm. And then as I taught, well, to begin with, I must have read in college and then after college, a few books, the, the Sufi message, the Sufis. Mm -hmm. As read in yeah. Yacan, Zen in the Art of Archery is generously quoted in my first book. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I read these things and then I started to have early forays into meditation and stuff. But I understood the equation was there's this one part of the brain and it's always churning and it's always creating situations that overlay on top of no situation. Mm -hmm. And I think I could see that. And of course, if I touched a single note on the instrument, I was already neurologically programmed to go into that space. Mm -hmm. In my life, I was very vulnerable to all these little ifs, ands, or buts. So I was making my own attempt to try to become uh, more of an instrument in my life like I would be. See, I don't consider myself a pianist. I consider myself the instrument that plays the instrument. Uh -huh. It's much nicer to be the instrument because then you're not responsible for anything. <laughs> when I say to people this, like even a, a little joke I have is, you know, I just played a concert and I was there. I was the instrument because I had to bring my hands to the piano. And someone comes up and says, uh, "Mr. Werner, you sucked." And I go, "Wasn't me." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and I kept building that belief. But mm -hmm. unlike most musicians, I was able to articulate it. That's unusual. Mm -hmm. When I started to articulate, you know, the, the people that are most articulate. Like, there's a great book I also followed, uh, um, oh man, Stephen Um, mm -hmm. but I can't think of the, the free play. Mm -hmm. I thought it was much more beautifully expressed than the way I express it. The guy's a writer. However, mm -hmm. he's not necessarily a player. So the people who were most eloquent have not had the experience. Mm -hmm. And the people who were experienced were not very verbal. So when I found myself like, like bilingual, I would play something, people would receive the resonance and then I found myself explaining it which mm -hmm. led to teaching which led to master classes which led to lectures which eventually led to writing my first book in 95 effortless mastering I just want I needed a data dump I needed to mm -hmm. acknowledge all these things that came through me that happened to be true they were especially not there was no erudition there it was all mm -hmm. intuition and it turned out to be spot on and when I look at it today is not nary a word to change because mm -hmm. I trust it because it came through me. I wasn't looking for it. My life is trying to be just like anyone for, I just want to play and people listen and pay for it. Then I want to write music and people play it and people come and listen and pay for it. But mm -hmm. I had this other ability to explain. And as I did, 
I gathered this whole other audience that would hear me differently when I played because mm -hmm. I had this sort of dual thing. And after I wrote the first book, the, be the biggest gift to me was I wasn't being judged a jazz musician or modern or avant-garde or traditional. Mm -hmm. It was the guy that wrote that book. Right, right. So I really got no prejudgment as they heard me play it. So it was a great liberator for me too. But it just kind of kept growing. And finally, in my early 60s, I made the decision to own it because I would still get an email today if I checked my email. Thank you for my first book. Now I'm getting it for the second book. But mm -hmm. I'll still get something that someone, a young person just read Effortless Mastery and they said it changed my life. Thank you so much. And I would be doing like, yeah, yeah, great. Thanks. I'm glad it helped you. But where's my next gig? And right, finally, right. I decided I should own this thing because I've had a bigger help. to. As a musician, we're not used to doing anything useful. But I wrote something that's been useful to, you know, many thousands of people read that book. And I decided in this part of life, I would own that and go into it. And I called Berkeley College of Music and I, I, I emailed the president. I said, I don't know if you're interested in this, but I've decided to come off the road and really support this thing I created, Effortless Mastery. And he mm -hmm. wrote me right back. He said, we'd be honored to have you start something here. I mm -hmm. was in music school and I was going to quit. And I read your book mm -hmm. and I didn't quit. So uh -huh. the book has had its own journey, which has pulled me in that direction. And the clearer I understood it, the more it descended on my music. So it was definitely, uh, you know, re a virtuous, a virtuous yeah. Uh, spiral, right? Yeah. And, um, and I became much more interested in the state of mind that created music than the music itself, which only benefited the music. <laughs> That's the funny thing about it. Right. And it, you have, a, have a, in your book throughout um, the idea that this needs to be spontaneous, that it needs to come from a place uh, you call the space. Um, but what you've done with it is you've used your, your, your conscious mind to, to, to detail it and explain it, so on and so forth. And so you, you kind of merged the two ideas in a way, because some, sometimes people only want to be in the space and, and, and don't want to have a conscious mind at all involved. Um, you have a couple of quotes to that effect. You know, there, there, one, one that I, I thought was very cute was uh, Native Americans were aware of the conscious mind and used it only as needed. <laughs> It's, it's sort of like a compliment, but she kind of... <laughs> feels well, if you had to build a TV, compliment. there was certain knowledge that was embedded. But see, that argues for really embedding knowledge. Yeah. You don't have to learn a piece that even if you believe in, you know, uh, whatever you believe in philosophically, the other half, you're spending too much processing power trying to play the piece. Mm -hmm. So it actually argues for learning something to a level where it plays itself. And every time it gets there, you go into this metaphysical space where you're mm -hmm. witnessing it you don't even have to be jealous of the player because the player is you mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <je> <laughs> all these you know uh i had one chapter on that it is the integration of left brain and right brain and i know that that has changed the research on that has changed right so it's more pop but the theory is lines. similar yeah. but they still say along those lines that the right brain go along creative lines and the left brain you know so yeah. if I'm going to get paid, that's a slightly more left brain thing. Or if I'm tying my shoes and make sure I have the same socks. When I get on stage and practicing is accruing more language, which at first it's, let's not say left brain, but at first it's the conscious mind analyzing what it takes for it to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But the part that many musicians leave out and that many people in other areas leave out, now I want to learn it so that I don't have to manage it. Because mm -hmm. that's when the, man the magic starts. Mm -hmm. So if I do that, I come out on stage in, a, for lack of a better term right now, a right brain state of mind, a total Shakti state of mind, because mm -hmm. I'm going to trust my hands. Now, that also uh, speaks of a different value system. The most important thing for me to do, I'm convinced when I get, if I'm in Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. the most important thing for me to do is not play the greatest concert in Carnegie Hall. It's to stay in a mode of self, self acceptance and receptivity through the filter of the language I studied. When you get those things together, even in the world of virtuosos now, there's something that rises above that. And, mm -hmm. and it's an unforgettable experience. It's the apex of what a human is 
uh, capable of, like a John Coltrane, for example, mm -hmm. or a Keith Jarrett. It, the, the technology is beyond, I mean, it, it was new technology when John mm -hmm. Coltrane played it, and yet he was praying. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, and you make it clear in your book too, although this is all about uh, music, it's, it applies to everything. The ones I think of, of our top athletes, basketball players, baseball players, ice skaters, you know, the Olympic ice skaters, you know, it, they can do the technical thing. You know that they've been spending 10 hours a day since they were four years old learning the, the material. But the ones that let go and, and are, are as if floating through the air while they're doing it, are the ones that everybody can't stop watching, right? Exactly. And they can both be cultivated. A big yeah. message in the book is that it's not about some of us have it, some of us don't. Everybody has it. Some of us know it, and some mm -hmm. of us don't. So how far from the fire are you? And what's in the way of the reality of that fire or that light? So mm -hmm. it's very much a sun and clouds thing. Uh, if Miles Davis had a sun in him, so do I, so do you. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is in how dull it gets blocked by clouds, and those are thoughts. Mm -hmm. So when that becomes the equation, it becomes now, how do I get into this moment and release myself from that world of thoughts? Mm -hmm. And one of the, th I think some of my innovations in the book come from the fact that I'm lazy. You know, uh -huh. I mean, I believe that it's, they say that uh, necessity was a mother of invention. I think laziness was a mother of invention. <laughs> I mean, why would a guy invent a wheel? He obviously didn't want to walk anymore. He was yeah. too tired to walk. So what I'm saying is that people can go into the space immediately if they don't have a, a time they think they have to stay in the space. Mm -hmm. If I said to you for 20 seconds, just watch it breathe, mm -hmm. you would be fully realized. Mm -hmm. Because you have nothing to, it's easy to drop everything if you know you can have it back in 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. So the modifications that have come over the years is the idea that anybody can be great for a moment, but the brain does take a snapshot of that. Mm -hmm. And what becomes a flash can become a very light neural footprint. But mm -hmm. if you keep going, you know, let me just give you, George, an example. Yeah. That's the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. Uh-huh. Now I see I'm already in an intoxicated state. Someone else would say that was a, just a waste of time. But if you went home and you mm -hmm. kicked your kitchen, let's say you kicked your refrigerator and it went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would think that's quite extraordinary. You would even call your friend and say, you got to come over and hear my refrigerator. <laughs> but because we don't, you wonder if scientific understanding of things have robbed us of the true connection to things. Mm -hmm. But that can be gotten back. You, we have to go into a state where this space, and I called it a non-denominational thing. Everybody has a name for this. Mm -hmm. The space, Hashem, the, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, the, uh, the West Africans call it the world tree. It mm -hmm. doesn't really, I call it the space because I'm from Long Island. Right. You know, and that's the thing. If a person understands that this wisdom dwells in them without doing anything, then it's a question of how can I just even sample it and get to know that's who I am in that place. Mm -hmm. And as that gets stronger, you start, and, and, and in shamanism, they call that samadhi, except it's usually referred to when it comes to dying. But there's mm -hmm. walking samadhi, there's talking samadhi, and there's playing samadhi. And what it really means is that you're in a suspended state and the playing happens by itself. Speaking of it, you had one... separation is available to everyone. Yeah, and we're going to get right back to that. But you, you had a great story about, about getting to that state. And you, the World Series was playing and you put the, the, the grand piano up, the, 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 the top up, and you had a TV right behind it and you played a concert with the TV behind that so nobody could see it. And you watched the game while you were playing your concert. Right? And it was one of my best concerts with the most organic flow of ideas because it was mm -hmm. never disturbed by my desire to play a good concert. Mm -hmm. it's also, you know the chapter on the King's speech? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a very telling moment. There's a moment, and I'm sure those of you who've seen the movie, it's a fantastic movie. But there's yeah. a moment 
where he, you know, the King George, I guess the sixth, was a stutterer. And now he's going to have to be king because his brother abdicated. And, and his, his terror was that he couldn't get through a speech. And uh, Godfrey Rush, this, this I, I kind of consider myself that. I have an unusual way of separating people from their uh, imperfection, from their feeling of being imperfect. And they're just committing a perfect act, if mm -hmm. only temporarily. So Godfrey Rush puts these headphones on him and he's listening to his Mozart piece. And then he has him recite Shakespeare, to be and not to be. And he can't hear himself at all. And when mm -hmm. he takes the headphones off, he thinks this is nonsense. But later in the movie, he puts the he gave him an acetate. And when mm -hmm. he heard it, it was the first time in his life he wasn't stuttering. Whatever yeah. that was applies to anything you would do, and especially to music. I think it's a, it's a great example. And it's you, you mentioned a little bit earlier how um, maybe a science is separating us from, from our reality. But life, an, an anxious life, you know, as separates us from our reality, every single bit of it. And so it's not really anything that's our enemy, except for our own internal way of thinking about these things. We can, we can become masters of science. We can become masters of music. We can become masters of anything. As long as we don't, as long as we have the confidence uh, it, to, to do it. And where does the confidence come from? It's how we perceive ourselves. And if your perception is you have to be perfect, there's no way to be confident. The there's only no way, way to be confident. confidence is to uh, celebrate failure. Yeah. That way, if it happens, it doesn't change your attitude. Uh, you, I, a lot of people have called me. Uh, I don't know if I've put this in the book or not, but a couple of times classical musicians called me and they said, I read your book, Effortless Mastery. I was the first one. Yeah. I agree with everything. Now, I have an audition for the first oboe chair of the Chicago Symphony. How do I do Effortless Mastery? <laughs> so I said to them, well, you don't exactly do Effortless Mastery. It is a reprogramming. And nothing mm -hmm. reprograms overnight. Right. I said, but and then this just came to me and it became part of the teaching, which is why I trust it. I said, but I'll tell you what, you commit to me today that no matter how that audition goes, you're going to go out and celebrate that night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Commit that to me today. And then if you do that, uh, you're doing effortless mastery. And yeah. I've done that about five times. And each time, uh, almost every time they, they got whatever they got. But even if they didn't, they just couldn't freeze up because they had to laugh to themselves they already committed to me three weeks ago that they're going out to celebrate. <laughs> you, know, you have to disarm this thing, this right. success failure thing. If it cuts down the totality of what you could be experiencing, I'd rather fail with self-love than succeed with carefulness. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, conclusions I did from a different angle, but, but very similar was everyone is a loser. Losers, uh, winners are just losers with more patience. Absolutely, or, or self, more self-love. Or yeah. like I said, just recently, I've, I've said, look, everybody feels like, and especially I'm sure the people in your universe are probably pretty advanced along these ways, one way or other. They may study this or that, but they understand that in the mind is the bondage of their experience. It's not the pandemic. Right. It's between the ears. And in the mind is liberation. So yeah. therefore, nothing that's happening out here governs the inner uh, and once you understand that, you work on that. But everybody's got a concept. I'm in it. Ah, damn it. I lost it. I'm in it. I'm out of it. Yeah. I've read this in other places. I, this is not a new idea. But when you are out of it and you don't care, that's the fastest way of getting back in it. Yeah. <laughs> so I've said like, and just recently I said this, which sounds kind of crazy, but it's exactly right. You know, there's this and there's that. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes this, there's no that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, and, and you know, it's non duality. I mean, it's as old yeah. as, older than the Bible, but in the Bible, if thy and I be single, you know, yeah. thy sight be divine or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. We can't decide that we're more, well, we can and we have for centuries. Uh, we've, we've held ourselves hostage to the success or failure of our. Uh, things but you see a musician goes out to, I, I i relate more to the jazz musician mm -hmm. but there are certain decisions jazz musicians make every night without worrying about the consequences because if they I, I, did they couldn't swing mm -hmm. so there's a lesson from music that if it's articulated right in language can really be helpful to someone else if you're going to go out 
I, I would like to coach the Yankees in case there's anybody here from the Yankees. <laughs> the Yankees I'm a little kid. I would coach somebody, if you swing a golf club, take a little bit of time, go into the space. And I can even give us a sense of that because I've narrowed it down to something so portable that we could use at any time. But go into the space, swing the golf club, don't care whether you hit the ball or not. Mm -hmm. Some of that will add some grace when you have the intention of hitting the ball. So when you touch the instrument, that as a background to yourself makes particular music come out with more freedom. Mm -hmm. Well, you had, you had the example of a jazz uh, group and, and uh, someone played very badly and then uh, the top jazz guy just played off of that and turned it into something wonderful and everybody. Oh yeah, well, well, yeah, I mean, there are some very enlightened and not in their whole life. You can get mm -hmm. a lot of enlightened information from certain musicians, if not their whole life, certainly from their music. So, for mm -hmm. example, that was Herbie Hancock. He's mm -hmm. playing with Miles Davis for the first time. So he's in his head. He's not in the space. Right. Herbie Hancock lives in the space. Him, Wayne Shorter, and these guys have been Buddhists for like 60 years, you know. Mm -hmm. However, some things in life overwhelm you and you cannot maintain your philosophy because you yeah. care more about having the right concert, the right outcome than you do your philosophy. And yeah, it will yeah, happen. But you keep practicing so that there's less and less that could throw you out of your game. So he's playing with Miles Davis for the first time. And for some reason, uh, he plays, he's disoriented and plays a chord that has no relation to the right thing. And Miles took off on a solo that was unbelievable when he played that chord. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about jazz the most, mm -hmm. that it is a living um, uh, proof of certain ideas we have about how to live. Like if you will trust that, you might be thrown into a new site. What I love about jazz is that a mistake could become the next wave mm -hmm. of music. <laughs> and everybody should understand that about everything they do. Mm -hmm. That it's that possibility exists. Yeah, it's a, one of the analogies I use is that, you know, you plan vacations, like you, you have a plan. It's a, a small version of planning your whole life out. And if you, if you feel that every single detail on your plan has to happen, you have a miserable vacation. Absolutely. But if it's just an outline and these are the high points and so on and so forth, and then you go with everything that happens along the way, then you have a wonderful vacation. And uh, it really is, it really is an attitude more than, you know, this I have to get. Uh, I, you see people out there, you know, I need this picture, then I need this picture, then I need this picture, then I had a good vacation, you know, and, and of course, that's just another version of the same thing. And it, it, it clearly can't be a fun vacation. It doesn't seem like. You know, we started to talk about something before we started, and it's a very important point. Mm -hmm. How do you allow that spirit part of you to rule mm -hmm. when there's a lot of, if, I don't know what to call it, if not left brain, there's a lot of particular information to absorb. God, just to, you know, just to book a plane ticket these days, you know. <laughs> How do you do that? And the answer is you don't challenge it in the heat of battle. You should have what the book suggests is exercises in carelessness so that you can open that part of your brain and then just go and do your job. And you might notice that you opened up headspace for creativity that wasn't there before. So the answer is this consciousness, super consciousness, whatever you want to call it, universal consciousness should be practiced in a place where a safe place so that and, and exercises I take people through, not just musicians. Mm -hmm. of doing things that they would think make them foolish. But that's only in a certain part of the brain. So what if we don't have that? What if we practice being foolish, but we don't? We can avoid the uh, condition of feeling foolish, right? Mm -hmm. Why does that open up in the brain when we're not trying to be foolish? So my answer to that is consciousness and carelessness can be practiced in a safe environment and definitely comes in handy when you're about to commit a specific action. That action has to form. It's funny because one of the definitions of the word yoga is formlessness inside form. Mm -hmm. I believe this is the highest thing. You can be a master of form, but within that you can do anything you want. So mm -hmm. part of it is the mastery of the language. The other part of it is letting go. And letting go means letting go of needing to succeed. Otherwise you're not really letting go. 
However, yeah. it is a compassionate universe because whenever you really let go, I can ask people, when you really let go of the need to succeed, isn't that when you succeed the most at whatever you're doing? So it seems like a leap of faith, but it seems to work out more than approximating freedom, uh, you know, approximating liberation. You have liberation means surrender. Surrender means for a musician, a musician would rather cut off an extremity than sound bad. Yeah. yeah. But you're not going to surrender unless you surrender the need to sound good. And what's on the other side of that is something that turn, turns the light on for the musician. While you're speaking, I was thinking of Robin Williams and his uh, form of comedy where he just let go. And I, but I was thinking of him because he, in other parts of his life, he, he couldn't do that. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you're, you're talking about something just in the context of music, but something for life altogether, for every, every uh, how we live our lives. And um, one of the things that you're, is interesting about the 20th century. Oh, and for so, me, it was growing yeah. up with Jonathan Winters, but- uh, yeah. I yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, he, right. Jonathan, Robin Williams, just, just, you mean right. he was, that was his, that was his mentor. His that biggest was his mentor. Guru, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, the, the idea of, of um, being in this universal mind or what, you know, as you said in your book, has all kinds of names, but it's interesting that this witnessing experience to be not quite so involved that you're the instrument, as you say, um, that this is, an experience a lot more people have had because of uh, modern medicine, because they've been brought back to life and, and uh, their near death experience, I mean, they didn't really die, but their near death experiences have given them very much that same experience right. of, of, of not being totally involved in what's happening, watching themselves on, on the surgery table, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's interesting because it's totally outside the context of any spiritual aim or anything like that. Lots of, people have had that experience it's something that our minds can do well you know it's it's, it's coming from about uh, multi directions now because i think mm. some of us on the planet are actually evolving to counterbalance <laughs> the other stuff right mm. and what we're seeing in science which is great the understanding of neurological pathways can explain everything from a from a a, a revelation you know, is that, is that God or is it one more percent of my brain than I've ever used before? <laughs> and then I just read a great book on psilocybin therapy, which is being revived now. It's a very big thing after, mm -hmm. after it was brought, you know, brought down because it happened to turn people on. It's mm -hmm. now becoming, but all these things, when you get to the point of them, they're saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a place where we can go where all the patterns don't have to be, they don't have to be, we don't have to be enslaved by those patterns. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes a near-death experience. Maybe it's a psilocybin with a, with a therapist. Maybe it's just learning to be in this space. I, I just want to share this with you because it's so simple. As mm -hmm. much as we think about meditation and this and that, this is how I show my students a flash of this. You're breathing, right? And everybody that's watching us is breathing. So how do I know that? Well, it's a gift to see. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you're breathing and I can't even see you. Now, it breathes no matter what you do. In a sense, we never need breathing exercises. We're all virtuosos. Mm -hmm. On our worst day, we're still breathing. On our best day, we lose somebody, still breathing. We meet somebody, we're still breathing. So we don't need a breathing exercise. But since it's some gizmo in us that breathes, let's take 20 seconds and watch it breathe. Go. And stop. I see John, uh, John, John, so George, when you look at yourself, mm -hmm. you will see a total transformation because 20 seconds is not a threatening amount of time. <laughs> and devoid of any spiritual intention, anybody mm. can watch themselves breathe. Just like there's traffic outside, there was traffic out there before you looked out there and then you're watching it. And main, but, but you see the brain just said, oh, this is George without all the superimpositions. Mm. 
And it doesn't forget that. So I have my students doing nothing but that uh, whenever they think of it for the first week. And what they put in their journal is really amazing because it's so portable, because it's so short. Here's the innovations. One, no attachment to spirituality. Mm -hmm. Something is breathing. You're just watching it, like looking in a window and watching cookies being made, mm -hmm. right? Two, it's for 20 seconds. So whatever you're worried about, you can drop it knowing that you can have it back in 20 seconds. And three, you leave it before it leaves you. Mm -hmm. You actually say, okay, stop. And if you noticed when I said stop, you didn't stop mm -hmm. because you were there. So there's sort of a reverse psychology to that. And the same thing with music. The less you need to be much, the less you need from music, the more it envelops you. Well, now, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but I'm going to go to another area because there's, a, I think, a reason why did we develop all of these anxieties and, 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 and these conscious attempts to try to change things all the time. And, of course, we can watch animals and we, we, you know, birds look like they're free, you know, fly, free as a bird, we, we even say. But if you watch them, they're, they're, when they're eating, they're afraid someone's going to come and eat them almost the entire time. So their, their conscious mind is also doing this. But that's not anxiety. That's fear. Well, okay. So, uh, well, I, I think of anxiety as like a, a minor form of fear. Wait, but anyway, can I just make a quick comment on it? Yeah, sure. If the bird hangs, uh, fear is that something's about to happen and it often happens. Mm -hmm. But anxiety is the constant worry that, that, well, you know what? You might be right. So take that away. Finish yeah, your but it's the kind, <laughs> but I, I see the difference. It's a good dis distinction. Um, but my point is, I just had a, a, another author on a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ann Burgess. Uh, she, she helped the, the FBI develop a profile for criminals. And one of the things she said was fascinating to me was that one thing that's very common in serial murderers is that they witness their crimes, that they are not involved in the crime when it happens. They feel like they're watching the crime while it happens. And that what's important to them is the rituals on both sides of it. And I, I bring that up because even in the ancient scriptures that talk about this, they talk about some people who aren't good when they get to this state, but, but you know, are, are destructive. And so I think th there's a reason why we have become conscious trying to say, we want this experience, but we also want to behave with each other in a way which, which is socially acceptable. So then after a while, we're watching other people's reaction to us all the time. And, and so... That's, that's what I said before at the beginning when we were chatting. Um, there's something about the conscious mind that if it merges, not merges, but, but works together with this other thing, that we can create a civilization where people are not all caught up in these details and driving themselves crazy, and, and, but actually learn, they get mastery of the piano, they get mastery of golf, they get mastery of something else, ice skating, and that shares that with everybody else. But as you said, the top of it is, is the physical mastery or the mental mastery plus this experience that you bring to it, which is free at the same time. Um, but I think there's a good reason in the basis, you know, in the base of civilization, if you go back far enough, for that anxiety to have developed. So I don't think we have to completely dismiss it as useful. <laughs> no, no, but, and you also can't stop it because I like to say no. my mind is smarter than me, but my hands play better than I do. <laughs> you know, so I know I can't dissuade my mind from where it wants to go, but I can take a break. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, you've got me, but I'm going to watch myself breathe for 20 seconds. Then I'm going to come back and surrender myself. I'm going to turn myself in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes after you've done that, you notice that the boogeyman's not quite there. Mm -hmm. Just establishing. I believe that interacting with other people is more an inside job. I don't think I can control. I can't make the phone ring but I can pick up the phone. I right. can't control how anybody perceives me, but I can find a harmonious place from within from which and look out from those eyes. And usually it results in the results you would have liked to had if you could control everybody's reaction, like yeah. what we were talking about before. So I do believe inner evolution is what uh, a universal mind, what I like about it is that you're, you could be a drop on a table and you can dry up pretty quickly. Or you can be mm. a drop in the ocean and you'll live forever. Yeah, yeah. Well, even the drops on the table just go up into the air. So when they, <laughs> when they drop. 
So there, there's still there's still something. But um, one of the things that you were just saying, uh, I was thinking about um, in terms of our ability to to perform in public, your musical performance, speaking in public. You said everybody is watching you, and are they are they happy with what it is that's going on? And I think people are afraid to perform in public. People are afraid to speak in public, mainly because they feel all of those judgments being made at them all the time. And I think all you have to do is say, all those judgments are fine. You can't control those judgments. The judgments are fine. And, and as you said, if you get to that state, you get much better judgment about what you're doing. Ironically. Ironically, than if but you do you it. Know what? The other thing the book posits is that that can be practiced. Mm -hmm. Right. Practice it when it's not like a lot of consequences on the table. Practice loving your lowest performance and your high. There are ways to practice that that may serve you when you get in front of people. As mm -hmm. one who has been performing since he's nine, I can mm -hmm. tell you it's never been my awareness of the audience. They're an ambience. Mm -hmm. Because I know they're there, I'm buzzing inside. And it's a, it's a dialogue between me and me, between this instrument and that instrument, knowing that that's the phenomenon that turns on the room. Mm -hmm. So you yep. could say, I want to not be too affected by people, but you know, right. But you do it that way, you're still doing it reactively. You're right. hoping you're not affected, and of course, you probably will be. But if you say there's nobody out there, it's between me and me, and you really have practiced it, everything else takes care of itself. So you have had this ability to do that from the inside out, from the, a young age in music. Is there some other part of your life that you cannot do that, that you have then had to transfer this thing? And because, you know, everybody isn't born with this ability, even in any area. So you have it in at least this area and you've begun to articulate it or you have articulated for other people. So is there an area that you've used, you've transferred that knowledge over to another area? I think that might be useful to people who have no areas at all. Yes, but without natural gift for that, it took right. me was as hard for me as it was anybody else. In fact, when you have a natural gift, there is a sort of a, a problem with that. You're used to something coming to you and then suddenly you're doing something you have no gift for and you have yeah. to work for it, but you didn't have to work for the first thing. So <laughs> it's a bit of a trauma, you know? Yeah. yeah, it was called life. Let's put it this way. I would make uh -huh. a decision but, or I couldn't make a decision because it had to be the right decision. But I've always known in music that even the wrong decision is the right decision if I don't question it. I've mm -hmm. known that since I'm nine. Mm -hmm. But in life, I would say in the last decade or two, I just kept saying, look, I know this is true. I've got to practice it. And uh, uh, yeah, so, all right. So here's a making decisions and under, from my musical experience, understanding the success is making the decision, not whether it works out or not. And that mm -hmm. really liberated a lot of things. I have a story in the book. Again, I'm on so, most solid ground if I'm talking about a musician's life, right? right? So here's a musician living in a small town and there's a little jazz club there. And the people that play in the jazz club, they're considered valid. And the people that have to sit in the audience are still wannabes, right? So mm -hmm. you want to play there. There's three actions you can take. Two of them are a success and one is a failure. Action one, you call the club without the slightest thought of what this guy's reaction will be. You say, I have a great band and we should be playing in your club. And the guy goes, oh, great. I have September 17th. You want that? Great. Mm -hmm. Success, right? Right. Number two, you are not in any way concerned about what the, what's going to happen. You pick up the phone and say, I have a great band and we should play in your club. And he goes, I'm not interested. And he hangs up. Mm -hmm. Success. The third action, you keep meaning the call. Maybe you need a cup of coffee before you call. Maybe you can't call today because you have a cold. Maybe you're waiting till you're really feeling self-confident and you never quite make the call because you're afraid of what the guy will say. Mm -hmm. That is a failure. Mm -hmm. Now that might be obvious to you, but that took 50 or 60 years for me to manifest. Yeah, And, and it comes from music. It and it and it come you, you carry that over from music and it makes uh, you know it makes perfect sense and it, it uh, the idea of, I can't do the it. idea of perfection sorry the idea of perfection uh, gets in the way all the time in a way uh, because we're trying and 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 whether or not our internal life is perfect as a lot of people say 
um, about this universal mind. That doesn't matter. You, it, we, we project from the inside out onto the world our whole lives. And if we're trying to project perfection out onto the world, it's not going to work. Um, right. But to do it the other way just takes practice. I guess yeah. I'm trying to give hope to people. You may not be the spiritual entity you, you fantasize about being, but there's incremental practice where you can grow in that direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, you talked about, uh, and I'm going to go back to the criminal uh, issue for a second. You talked about the Bhagavad Gita. It's a very, very famous uh, book in India. It's a por portion of the Mahabharata. And you talked about it. And uh, the whole conversation is one of uh, Krishna and Arjuna trying to, to discuss whether Arjuna is going to go out and battle the other side, which includes his relatives. Oh, yeah. And it goes through a large number of yogic ideas and everything like that. But the bottom line is Arjuna never really buys any of the arguments and he keeps protesting, protesting. And finally, Krishna says, I'm, I'm, I'm God and you just have to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, not everybody gets a Krishna, you know, but so what's, what's, what. what oh, and, and, and my, my question is, this is again, even though it's a major scripture, it's again about being a witness to your action, whether it's whatever it is, it's your, in this case, it's your duty to do something like that. And I think that's one of the ideas that, that gets in our way, actually, that, that we have to do certain things. We have to perform at a certain level. We have to do, uh, we have to satisfy some other mind uh, that has a very high standard for us. Um, very fascinating philosophical well, discussion. If that worked, then I would recommend it, but it never works. But it never works, right. Right. So what does work is throwing away the consequences, but that takes practice. Yeah. And, it, and what's tough for society is if everyone throws away the consequences, you know, what are we going to do about uh, all those consequences of people? You know, if you, if you do it within a group of musicians, everybody has a certain, you know, idea about what to do with their lives and how to perform and everything. Um, this is a slight aside, a lot of people want to read other people's minds. Uh, but if you actually read all the ch chats in the YouTube uh, that are on, on the internet and all kinds of other statements that are going on, you really don't want to get in most of those people's minds uh, because what they're doing is just spilling, you know, what's going on inside of them. And if they, if they get too free and easy, I think most people will feel that they, the consequences for society will be very difficult. Well, I think history shows us in religion, even in music, things go kind of like very open and free. And then mm -hmm. someone comes along and says, hey, this whole thing has collapsed. And they introduce a new austerity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can see that in the history of religion. Humans have to keep bouncing back and forth to find the balance of action without attachment. Mm -hmm. They So they go and they trip out on the without attachment thing. And perhaps they get lazy, but it's okay because I'm not attached. Then right. they need to practice discipline to uh, to bring it back into shape. So yes, I mean, this is a battle that we haven't won. It's going to be an ongoing thing. What I'm trying to add to it is that you don't have to be anybody special to be God. Absolutely. And uh, you, the way you said it was just great because a lot of people, when they think about this, they think of fatalism, you know, just accepting whatever the universe throws at you. But that's not really the point I of Bhagavad Gita. Go off the, off the rails with that too. Yeah, but exactly. I'm talking so, about, let's say, Let's say you want to make a difference. You start right. taking actions and they don't have to work out. You'll take more actions. Right. Action causes things to happen. But if you're worried that if you want to think, what can I do? Then you won't begin. So, you know, it, it is a balance. But all I'm saying is that the part of you that feels that something is moving through you and that you don't have to invent it, however you do it, it's very beneficial to practice it every day and open that part of your brain. I think most of this now, I think the neurology is just beginning mm -hmm. to really understand. I'm not saying there is a God or there isn't a God. I tell a story in the book about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in program for various things and, uh, you know, and I don't mind saying that, uh, you know, so I was in program for cocaine, right? So mm -hmm. cocaine anonymous, everybody's coming from wall street in the eighties you know, yeah, yeah. to the meetings, right? But if you go to uh, Narcotics Anonymous, that's a different crowd. Mm -hmm. That's like some really rough people. So this one guy comes in once 
And he says, and they say, who are you? And he says, my name is this. What do you do? I'm a hitman. I don't know if you remember that in the story. You know? Yes, I do. Wow. So he does whatever he wants to do. Nobody tries to help him. Nobody, you know. And one guy's up there one day. It's tougher than him. He says, look, you're not going to stay sober unless you give it to your higher power. So you see this chair here? Every day when you come in, I want you to ask this chair to keep you sober. <laughs> so I'm watching this guy and I'm seeing an evolution of respect for that chair mm -hmm. as time's going on. And so the question is, was God in the chair already? And he's finding it. Was, is there is no God? Uh, was it his faith and respect that created the sacredness of the chair? It doesn't really matter. We are more powerful than we think. Faith is a terrible thing and a wonderful thing. Because mm -hmm. if I have faith that on my worst day, God is playing, mm -hmm. I don't need to know that's true. I need to keep building the faith that that's true. And then that gets baked into reality. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. whether it's true or not. It is true. Mm -hmm. The terrible thing about faith is if you take it out of that issue and say into politics. Right. In fact, that's been my theory about what's going on. You've taken faith itself is a neurological process. If you mm -hmm. take that faith and you take it out of this unmeasurable thing into things that can be measured, mm -hmm. it's still up. No, I'm sorry. I know you're showing me this right in front of my eyes, but my faith tells me it's wrong. Yeah. And someone yeah. brilliantly managed to modulate the use of faith in the marketplace and the use of faith in the, in the body politic. And that's kind of my theory about it. But my faith is that music's not important enough for me not to love myself. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality. It took faith until it took no faith to believe it. Mm -hmm. It's just a reality. You could touch a keyboard, and because of the neurology, one person is dipping their hands in warm water after they've been making snowballs without gloves. And it's like, <laughs> you put your hands on here, ah. Oh. And for another person, it's like touching a hot stove. Yeah. So it's the same instrument. The whole thing is the state of mind, which takes me back to what I've become the most interested in. You know, I'd rather have the right state of mind and fail than keep holding on for some limited form of success. I found myself in this whole career because if something wanted to come through my mouth, I said it. And I do believe that the structure comes to the things I study. It's not like random. Someone's not going to sit down and play great piano because they're free. Mm -hmm. But if yeah. they play the piano from the same quiet place, then they notice that the language comes out in the most organic way. In fact, that's the most authentic thing they can do because they're not trying to make it sound like something else. So a musician you know, will say to you, if you said to a musician, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to really sound good, right? But mm -hmm. if in a conversation, I said, George, when you talk to me, what are you trying to do? Kenny, when I talk to you, I'm trying to sound good. <laughs> then it's very obvious. So there's yeah. a lesson from music to life. Do you want to sound good? Or do you want to come from the what arises from within and trust it, supported by what you're studying? And that is the sweet spot. I mean, we, we mentioned you know, top golfers, top sportsmen, the ice skaters, the musicians, uh, every, everybody that performs at the top. There's a sweet spot between having practiced and gotten that down so that they have the muscle memory, they have the thing, and then then perform as a free person. And then trust. Yeah. But and, trust and, doesn't come from the, the guarantee that you're going to succeed. No, trust no. comes from the, the knowledge that you're blessed whether you succeed or not. Exactly. That's just an excellent way to end. So thank you very much, Kenny, for, uh, for joining us. Uh, for I'm honored, honored to be part of your group you know we listen to the commonwealth club all the time I, so my wife is very impressed that i'm going to be on here <laughs> well you're a great addition kenny thank you so much for the for describing it so perfectly um well or imperfectly maybe better way to put it <laughs> simply, simply. <laughs> <laughs> and so ends another event at the commonwealth club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion thank you very much for joining us and come back and see us again soon thanks kenny thank you george